Welcome to another edition of Official Insights Modernizing Government, an interview series with government officials tasked with making services to the public more accessible and efficient, particularly as it pertains to payments. This series is presented by our partners at American Express. I'm your host, Joe McKeating with Grant Street Group. Joining me today is Mike Baca, Chief Information Officer for the Tax and Revenue Department in New Mexico. Mike, welcome. Hey, good to be here, Joe. Thanks. So I think a good way to start this interview for viewers would be to give an overview of what it is that the Tax and Revenue Department does in New Mexico. The Tax and Rev Department is awesome. We are not just a revenue department, we're also a motor vehicle department. And those are two strikingly different lines of business, but two very important things for your state constituents. Um, taxes are something that happened to everybody. Motor vehicles are something that happened to everybody. Everybody needs a driver's license. Everybody's gotta be compliant with our tax rules. So you could say we have a, a captive customer base. Um, but here at this department, we are very customer centric. We are cu customer focused. Um, the, the lines of business that we do are pretty cool. You know, we, we collect revenue, which is important, but we also distribute revenue. And that's my favorite part. You know, we fund schools, we fund hospitals, we fund law enforcement. Um, it, it's, it's just all over. You can't walk down the street without seeing the stuff that we're making happen. Likewise, driver's licenses. Everybody's got to have one, you know, um, and, and it, it runs the gambit. You know, you've, we, we'll, we'll get people there at our offices getting their very first driver's license, you know, a kid in high school getting that first credential. Truckers, um, commercial driver's license. It's just all these different things that we do, and we interact with some really cool customers along the way. And just what, especially in this past year when so much uh, business, so much activity has moved online and out of offices. Uh, has that presented any unique challenges or even just opportunities uh, to, to your department? Oh, absolutely. The, uh, the, the health crisis of 2020 continued into 2021. We're, st we're still dealing with it and figuring stuff out. But along the way, our, um, our customers look to us for answers, for, for ways to keep them safe, for ways our, our our employees looked for us to us to keep them safe. And right from the get-go, we decided that, that this was something we were gonna address aggressively. Uh, we, we wanna get through this health crisis with the, with the least amount of negative impact to the people of New Mexico. The way we did that is through technology. It was amazing. It, the, um, we, we just revolutionized the way we delivered technology. Um, I could say back in the olden days, you know, a year and a half ago, um, rolling out a new IT project, a new technology, a new customer channel was tough. It took, it took years of planning, negotiating, convincing, telling people that, that you know, this is the right way to go. Once the pandemic hit, we, we had a mindset change. It, it was a true paradigm shift. And, um, and, and you didn't just see that in, in government. You saw that in public sector. You saw that in the way you shopped for your groceries. And, um, at first, we, we, we took things way, way down, way, way down. In fact, we closed our offices and we did a little regroup. At the same time, we monitored what was happening in the, in the world that couldn't close. You know, what was happening in the grocery stores? How are they responding to it? And we leveraged a lot of the great ideas and tweaked them into what would work for government. So, um, you know, the, the way you used to get a motor uh, driver's license completely changed. The way you used to register your car completely changed, and it, it approved. Um, our customers really like the way they're doing business now. We have so many more online channels that it's really put a lot of relief on the way we transact business in the offices. So Mike, do you think that there's anything that goes on in a motor vehicle office right now that won't eventually be moved online to some sort of a virtual office? When you look at government functions, People just kind of shrug their shoulders and say, that's, that's the way it is. You have to go to MVD and you have to take a whole bunch of documents and they have to tell you that those are the wrong documents and you have to come back two or three or four times. Um, we've looked at the pain points. The pain points is really where you can identify opportunities for innovation. Where does it hurt the most? And you need to talk to your customers, but you also need to talk to your staff. They know the business. They know what's going on out there. I think that the future of MBD is just beginning to happen. 
We are, we are innovating in ways that, that people have yet to imagine. Um, if you look at what we're doing with the driver's license credential and where it's going, there's a lot of talk about mobile ID. And I think mobile IDs are gonna be pretty cool. We're already seeing that kind of functionality happen in transactions on our cell phones. And it's just a small leap ahead for our driver's license to be trusted within our, our um, smartphones. I think that's gonna be very exciting. Well, let's talk about payments specifically. And from the time that you uh, started, uh, until now, what, what's changed over the years in terms of accepting payments and, and trends that you've witnessed play out over these years? Oh man, so, so when I started here at the Tax and Rev Department, one of, one of the biggest obstacles we had to overcome was something called PCI compliance. And um, the credit card industry really, really changed the way we looked at security in, in the industry. Um, you know, if you were to roll it back 20 years ago, what you, what, they, they would have a printed book and they would look up credit cards that weren't any good and then the transaction would go through. Now, oh my gosh, it is so much more difficult and so much more challenging to conduct a safe transaction. Um, there again, I think we, we looked at ways that the industry had innovated and we tried to implement them here. Instead of handing your credit card to, um, to a stranger, you held onto your credit card and, and actually touched the machine. Um, I, think, I think those kinds of changes really make a huge difference and they build trust with, with your customers, with your, in our case, the citizens of New Mexico. They expect that they can pay for anything with a credit card and we have to support that. Um, it's, frankly, it's, it's, the, um, it's the preferred way of conducting transactions anymore. What about with, uh, with payments specifically? I mean, we've come a long way. We have saved payment information, uh, single click checkouts, where where can we go from here? What's what's the future for for payments in general and maybe government specifically? There there was a huge wave of adoption during the pandemic. People people accepted that it was easier to get online and buy something and have it shipped to their house. They didn't have that immediate reward of walking out of the store. But the safety aspects of it kind of impressed people with the convenience of it. And um, I think payments are going to continue to get streamlined. Um, you know, you see, you see some, of the, some of the big dogs in the industry uh, with the, with the one time, um, you can fill out your information once and you use it many times. That, that, that's the best thing. That really is the best thing. The problem we have with it is connecting to it. Where is, where is that connection going to be? And you know, right now it's, it's with, a, with a plastic credit card that maybe you insert a chip or, you, or um, or it's, it's, it's an online service that pays your bills for you. But there's that connection and that authenticity part, which kind of goes back to the security aspect of it. And, um, and I, think, I think people are starting to accept. Most people are opening their, their locked cell phones with a fingerprint or a smile. And, um, and I, I think in the future, we're gonna be making payments using our, our own biometrics. What about um, something like QR codes? Are you are you bullish on QR codes, which seem dormant for so oh long? Oh my gosh, Q, QR codes reminds me of Star Wars. It's like you know that we, we thought we had we thought we had seen the last of the QR codes when Luke Skywalker um, blew up the Death Star, and then all of a sudden the QR code strikes back. I I think QR codes are here to stay. Uh, we've got them here in our offices. We use them for um, you know when when people check in. Instead of signing in and all that stuff, they, they flash a cue card and they fill out a form online or it's streamlined um, after the first time. And um, it, it's great. QR codes are here to stay. But it's like you said, it seemed like they'd been around forever and it took a bad situation to force adoption, basically. But now, now, they're, now they're here to stay. Back to, to your office, what are some projects that you're working on that you're really excited about and, and would like people to know about going forward? Um, we're doing a couple of pilot projects with, uh, with our motor vehicle side in um, kiosks. We've, entered, we've, we've deployed a couple into grocery stores. And, um, and, the, and the adoption there is, is, is happening slowly, as it should, should be. We, don't, we didn't want a giant um, avalanche of work. We want a snowball of work. But um, people are starting to see that, that they can go to a kiosk and, um, and they can, they can re-register their car. Um, they, could, they can do some pretty neat high-level transactions. Um, at a kiosk 
and they can get stuff back from us right away. Um, registration, um, eventually license plates, things like that are going to be pretty neat. I think as the technology matures, we're going to see more and more motor vehicle transactions that don't require a field office. Right now, there are still some that do. You know that you know when when Joe wants to go get his first driver's license, you're going to have to show up and take a test and and uh, and provide a certain um, level of um, you know, birth certificate, certificate from your training school, and all that. But um, as, as time goes by, I think it's going to get better and better. So we're excited about kiosks. Um, we're also excited about, so we, we do transactions in person, we do transactions online, and we do transactions over the phone. I think over the phone is, is, a, is, is a proved method of dealing with people. But phones are kind of passe. What you're going to see now more and more between government and constituency are um, virtual help online. You know, the, that conversation is going away from the, the phone and more and more online. And you're, you're still chatting with a real person. You might be typing. You might be very likely multitasking. You know, as you wait your turn, you're, you're also, um, you know, answering emails or, or doing, doing your work or maybe you're, you're having fun. But... Um, but that chat online is going to change the way we do business as well. So, Mike, we've been talking a lot about the Tax and Revenue Department specifically, of course, because you're the CIO. But what does good government at large look like to you or how do you define that? Government is is an organization that most people don't get. You know, there's you know, in New Mexico, we've got 80 plus agencies that that the constituent has to navigate. And it's complicated and it's frustrating because I just gave my name and my address and my blah, blah, blah to the tax and rev department. Why do I have to go give it to this other department now? Um, I think good government in the future is, is really going to streamline that. I think that it should be transparent to the constituent who they're working with. They don't need to know the ins and outs of the tax and rev department and the motor vehicle department and the workforce solutions department. And we're working towards that now. We are forming partnerships, trusted partnerships with our sister agencies to really smooth things out for our constituents. So one of the things that we did was partner with the public education department. And we actually passed a statute last year to support that effort and support the schools in tracking where the, where the economic dynamics are and how we can, and, and they're using that information to help the kids. Now that's at a macro level. You know, that's using some very high level aggregate data. But um, at the micro level, we, we force people to repeat themselves over and over again when they try to work with government. And some of the things that we're working on is, is matching that data across agencies and using that to support, um, to support our constituents. Um, there's, there's a couple of things that, that happen in government that are very important to, to our society. And one of them is the collecting of taxes. But the other thing is matching the needs of our constituencies to that revenue. Um, at the federal level, you've got something called an earned income credit. Uh, we, have a, we, have a, we have a working families tax credit at the state level. We were able to leverage those two datas to identify um, constituents who weren't taking advantage of that extra help. So working families were missing out on the working families tax credit. And we did a little bit of outreach to the folks. We were able to take our data and use that to make the decision to reach out to individuals and say, hey, we think you might be eligible for this. Um, and we were able to connect a lot of people to that working families tax credit. And definitely during the, the year of the pandemic and the year after, I'm sure that made a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. Uh, we partner with um, unemployment department or the labor department, or we call it the workforce solutions department. We partner with them. We also protect people. There's a lot of fraud going on, you know, just, just like there's a, there, there are individuals out there who are trying to capture your tax return data and capture your, um, your refund. 
and we are partnering with other agencies to prevent fraud. And it happens all over the place. But our data can be used as a shield. Um, I, I think that as our constituents begin to trust us more, one of the things that I want most is a cell phone number. With a cell phone number, I can keep in touch with you, Joe. And to think of it like when you order something online and they tell you your package just shipped. Your package is gonna arrive on Wednesday. Your package was just delivered. I mean, those little positive messages as a text mean a lot to the customers now. That, that, that translates to maybe your refund. Hey, Joe, we just got your tax return. It'll be processed in about two weeks. Hey, Joe, we just processed your tax return and, you, and your refund will be, processed, will be mailed out in the next week. Hey, Joe, we just mailed out your tax refund. Awesome. I, I, like, I like those positive affirmations. But what happens if somebody's trying to steal your refund? You're going to get that text message on your cell phone and think, wait a minute, I've been procrastinating that. I haven't done my taxes yet. How can you be sending out a refund? There's just ways, smart with things that government can do to, to help protect our constituents and to help make good policy decisions. But it involves us working together. We need to tear down the silos of the olden days and think about it with a new perspective. Uh, before we wrap up the, the interview, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about that you're working on or that we haven't covered? Joe, that, that is a great question. I think, I think I'll take it to, uh, to an interesting place. I, I have worked in private industry. I have worked um, in the education world and I have worked for state government. Um, I even worked for the Los Alamos National Labs for a little while. Of all those places, there's nothing like a government career. And I know there's, there's a lot of demand right now for information technology professionals. And um, I will tell you this, the working in government, contributing your skills around technology towards the, um, the needs of a state as dynamic as New Mexico, it has been one of the most rewarding things ever. Um, you, you will have an, if, if you chose a career in, um, in government, you would have the opportunity to work and touch your, your everyday normal person and also some really extraordinary people. Technology and government is at the cutting edge. We are about to snowball into something incredible. I can just feel it. And if there's any folks out there thinking about a technology career or where they would like to apply that, I would just encourage you to, um, to go for it. Give government a shot. Um, I know technology folks are in demand, but the stuff that we do matters and that makes a huge difference in people's lives. Thank you, Mike, for participating in this episode of Official Insights, Modernizing Government. It's been really insightful and it's been fun talking.